help but think of a business model where we had a, a booth outside of Bush Stadium last night that said, are your ears ringing? You know, and we had these little things, of course, you know, FDA approval and all that stuff. But uh, in any case, we have a very diverse group of technologies for you, for your uh, consideration today. And the next one is uh, Dr. David Lightfoot. And he's a professor at our College of Agriculture here. And he will present on his uh, SDS uh, crop protection technologies. Like that. Or on the other hand, maybe 
my job, you don't. <laughs> um, so, sudden death syndrome was, was the first thing I was asked to do when I came to Southern Illinois University in 1991. Deal with it, David. You might get tenure. <laughs> um, and what we did was recognize that uh, there wasn't really any full-blown resistance out there, not the sort of knock it dead and, and, and don't give it a niche kind of resistance that, that breeders like to work with. And what we had to do was like stack in a lot of little genes for resistance into a pyramid or gene stack and, and deploy that. So here we are in um, the ARC, which is just off Pleasant Hill Road. Pleasant Hill Road goes up there. If you go that way, you'll hit Murfreesboro. If you go that way, you'll hit the, uh, the hooks. Uh, gas station in about a mile. And we've got sudden death syndrome in the field, and we've got our gene stack on this side of the white line, and we've got uh, actually a pioneer cultivar here, and a Monsanto one there. And they're showing the early signs of sudden death syndrome, which is this, this um, kind of yellowing of the leaf. Uh, they're gonna, this is going to reduce the yield of the stuff on this side of the line by 20% by harvest. And my gene stack's just going to cruise on through that. What SDS? Say. Um, this, this is the sort of variation we're looking at then in this type of resistance. You can find some beans which accidentally by chance have got uh, uh, the, gene, the gene stack or near to the gene stack and they'll, they'll show full resistance to the same dose of uh, sudden death syndrome pathogen that this little seedling over here has been absolutely crippled by. I mean, this thing's not going to form a plant. It's dead. Got no roots, got no leaf. It seems to be. And then you see a variation of the um, root disease and the leaf disease uh, that's continuous. It's, it's um, quantitative variation. We call it quantitative because how much have you got? I've lined these plants up based on their root scorch reaction. Um, so worst to best. But then if you look up at the leaves, you see, hey, wait up. They're not, that doesn't follow. So the root disease isn't the same as the leaf scorch. And um, before our technology, all the breeders and biotechnology companies could do was look at the leaves and say, oh, it's resistant or it's not resistant. But you could look at something like this and say it's not resistant when it really was doing quite well in the roots. And you could look at something like that, which has got fairly decent leaves and no root and say, oh, that's resistant. And in fact, that does happen. So the uh, poor grower doesn't know when he buys a bag of resistant seed, really what he's getting. Is he getting this or is he getting that? <clears throat> um, SCN is the other uh, disease that we've had to deal with and um, it's um, the most damaging pathogen of all agriculture. So nematodes take about 4% of the world food production every year in all crops. There isn't a major world crop without a nematode problem. The soybean cyst nematode um, takes 4% of our soybean crop, which is um, what, close to half of what Illinois produces, but it's pretty big. Um, it produces these little lemon-shaped cysts on the root, and that's actually one female worm who's died in, in the act of producing 200 eggs. So each one of these females that manages to reproduce produces 200 uh, um, clones. This is busy. Um, here's the nematode when she is young, and she's looking for a good place to set up home. She's aiming for somewhere close to the vasculature, close to the close to the um, plumbing system, the plant, uh, where where the water goes up and the food and sugars come back down. She wants to set up a, a, a feeding site there called a giant cell where she can, she can uh, um, nourish her 200 young offspring. Um, we developed from our gene stack one gene at the center of the stack that can give us resistance to both of the pathogens. And um, we found this quite by accident. It was supposed to be giving resistance to this critter. But when we tested it, it gave resistance to both of them. We were absolutely delighted. So here's a, a, um, a bean without our gene, and here's a bean 
and with our gene. Same again, without and with. See how we're scorching and here we're not scorching. And here are the roots, um, with our gene and without our gene. So nasty scorching there uh, and nothing there. And here again is the, is the variation. This one gene taken out of the stack, and I have to hasten to say this is so far, we've got six of these to do. This one gene turns out to be a sensory protein, and what it's doing is it, it sits in the outside of the cell membrane on the trachea element. This little wooden thing there is, is supposed to show you the, the xylem flow, and it senses proteins that are coming out of the nematode spit and out of the fungal uh, excretions as they attempt to eat the root. Um, in its uh, susceptible form, it gives the signal, OK, send out a new trachea element initial toward this new requesting site. Because there's some good things over there that we can go eat, not realizing that the signal is coming from a stealth pathogen that's saying, send me things to eat. In its resistant form, it says, wait a minute, you're a pathogen. I'm not going to send you a trachea element at all. I'm going to send you back something bad. So it's a pretty clever technology. <clears throat> Switching gears now, the Japanese beetle. There they are, happy little critters they are too. They spend their whole day eating and reproducing. The ladies depart in the afternoon, crawl down the stem of whichever plant they're on, usually my roses. <laughs> and deposit eggs in the soil. The eggs then um, hatch over the winter and form white grubs. I'll show you a picture of those in a moment. We didn't have Japanese beetles until about 1990 around here, and then they were a minor problem. Then by 1997 we went, wait a minute, these things are getting annoying. Uh, they invaded our, our state from the Indiana side. Um, they became endemic by, two, uh, by 2001, and now they're everywhere. They have attempted to cross the Rocky Mountains three times, and three times we've beaten them back with millions of dollars worth of pesticides. Uh, they will eventually make it, so if you're ever on sabbatical in California, don't take your house plants. <laughs> you will be arrested. <laughs> you should be arrested. Because um, these little white grub things down here cost billions of dollars a year to our turf grass industries. And our turf grass seed is all produced in Oregon. If these things ever hit Oregon, we're in serious trouble. No, turf, no, no overseeding. They um, love soybean until the corn uh, produces tassels, and the tassels are the, 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 the reproductive parts of the corn plant, and they're very, very sugary. The little, uh, um, they go for sugar. They go for the most sugary food available. So uh, soybean leaves will do until the corn tassels. This is what they can do to a soybean plant. Um, fortunately, our economic loss in a soybean plant from insect herbivory is pegged at 30% of leaf area lost on the canopy. And that's a lot of leaves for a Japanese beetle to eat. So it rarely reaches the point where we have to spray insecticides. But you know, who came up with that 30% value, you might ask? An inquiring mind should ask. And the answer is um, three or four soybean breeders and a jug of beer. <laughs> so, probably isn't that good. Um, there are resistance genes for Japanese people, and we discovered them first, and it was a lucky guess because there are no resistant plants to the Japanese beetles. Japanese beetles will eat anything. If you pick one up, it'll start chewing on you. It's not very clever. It will, there are some crabapple varieties out there which will stun it with, with uh, phytochemicals make it uh, go into a coma, but it won't stop eating. <laughs> when it wakes up, it'll go straight back to eating the same thing. So we figured that Japanese beetles, OK, are not a problem in Japan. Japan's had soybeans for a long time, a lot longer than the US. We only got them in 1950. Um, so maybe the soybean has developed some resistance uh, to the Japanese beetle, and it sure enough does. And one of the genes is in exactly the same place as our nematode resistance gene. OK, so the nematode is also a sort of insect. It's a pinworm. It's the kind of insect that doesn't develop wings and fly around anymore. It stays in. It stays as, as in, in the little wormy form. So this 
So we've got all this technology and it's all covered by patents and we have to do something with it. Um, our initial attempt, and the reason we have a company out here, was to provide mark assisted selection to the soybean breeding industry. And this is the soybean breeding industry as it exists now. Uh, here we have Monsanto, the huge gravitational force in the field. Syngenta, also used to be known as Ciba Geigy, that's the Swiss operation. DuPont Pioneer, uh, a Delaware company. Uh, we've got Lima Grain over there. Bayer, a major pharmaceutical company up here. Um, and there's probably Dow and BASF. There we are. The big six, the six biggest companies in the world. They do everything. They produce pharmaceuticals, they produce agricultural chemicals and they're into soybean breeding. And they all have business relationships with um, all the small guys, all the guys we used to make good money from servicing, <coughs> now have to go through their parent company. And this has been the effect of transgenes, I would say. Monsanto's transgenes and Pioneer's transgenes. Everybody has to have a licensing deal. As part of that licensing deal, you can't outsource your selection. <coughs> it all has to go through the big six. And the big six all have these interrelationships which um, allow them to um, command the industry. They describe their position as a uh, world of domination is the goal. They want to get down to two of these companies who command the agricultural chemical and agricultural biotechnology industries and uh, eventually <coughs> monopolist commission allowing one company. So we have to work through them. The small business opportunity then is more limited than it used to be. We have to do a lot more licensing deals. So we have these major targets. We've talked about the nematode resistance genes are valued at $1 billion a year's worth of losses. The fungus resistance is about the same now. Uh, drought tolerance I'm not talking about today is bigger. The nutraceuticals is bigger again. Um, we have found these important genes. We've patented them. The Illinois farm gate income is being increased by the use of these genes through licensing with those big six companies. We increased patent royalties to the College of Agriculture for this research. Um, it's always been a team effort. Khalid Mexen um, joined the team in 1997, has been instrumental in getting this all pushed through. He was here earlier, but and will be here later, but uh, can't be here right now. Dr. Gori is the expert that's been hired by SIU in the area of fungal pathology, and he's been a big help to us pushing through the new stuff on SDS. Jason Bond here is the nematologist, uh, um, has helped us a great deal with testing the transgenics for SCN resistance, and those are the two I want to mention. And here is the, the patent portfolio that we have, um, 2001 issued a 1996 patent for sudden death syndrome of cyst nematode resistant soybeans and that was our initial founder of patent. Now you don't hear this too often but I wish I'd come to SIU one year earlier because I got scooped <laughs> on the SCN side of things by Pioneer DuPont 1996. One of my own graduate students from Oregon State University. <laughs> God bless him David. <laughs> Webb. Um, got there on the SCN resistance first, and he did it by cheating. He didn't even do it in his own lab. He contracted the whole thing out. Darn it. <laughs> um, anyway, so that patent is a founder patent. It's the third patent on soybean uh, resistance loci ever, and it still runs, and it, so it holds a great deal of value because it claims very, very large regions of the soybean genome for SIU. 2007, uh, an offshoot of that same patent issued, which was for just for the greenhouse assays. This is now the ability to select those SDS resistant beans in the greenhouse using the assay that we developed whilst we were trying to find the genes. Last year, we had the. Oh, here it is. Uh, last year, around about Christmas, a Christmas present was. Um, I heard in 2010 and it issued in 2011, like January the 3rd, the protein that's in the transgenes was granted to us, so rights to modify, make, and uh, sell 
the protein that gives the resistance to both diseases was granted to us. In process are at least four patents, and Carly might surprise me yet, and have yet another one, for other genes in the gene stack. We expect all of these to issue. So what we develop here is a patent portfolio that covers the landscape of the resistance genes. In other words, um, companies have to work through SIU to deploy this technology in any modern way. All they can do without us is breed and select from the field in the way people were doing before I came to SIU in 1991. So we hold a um, technology gold mine here, and uh, the, the issue is who's going to take the whole package, who's going to pay for an exclusive, and who's going to or, alternatively, which set of companies are going to pay us for non-exclusives. And that's where Aiden and Jeff would be most helpful. We are pushing forward on our rights. The issue to this point has been my graduate student's patent, which was <laughs> the first, my ex-graduate student's patent, after he went to work for Pioneer, <laughs> was the first in the area. And because they claimed the cis nematode resistance gene in part, in genes in five different locations in the soybean genome, they, until 2016, own 20% of the genome of a soybean. Imagine that. For any resistance and any gene that's found there by legal precedent. So 2016 will be a very profitable year for SIU. Uh, on, and until then, we um, are holding our position not blinking and saying, well, look, guys, this patent position is strong. It's getting stronger. And uh, you must, at some point, license this technology. And I guess that's today's story. Publications come out. Uh, tenure was granted. Everything was happy. So don't let anybody tell you that you can't be an assistant professor and patent things. You can. You just have to be quick. <laughs> Yard chemical, I make my kids go outside with respirators and uh, <laughs> 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 I 